uh, meaning that it causes death uh, quite um, you know painfully. Um, and then also it's quick. It's a very quick way to to to. It's the quickest way um, for maternal death. Uh, so between 20 minutes to two hours, a mom is dead. Uh, so that was sort of like the problem. That was the main thing I wanted to solve. And the final insight that I think helped me start Life Bank was um, between eight out of 10 women who die in childbirth uh, from postpartum hemorrhage could be solved by just bringing blood to the hospital. That was it. Uh, so I felt like we could build a distribution system focused on blood for mothers specifically uh, that delivers blood around the clock. And that was the that was the idea behind Life Bank. Wow, I mean that's a very um, touching story, but also it's a very real one. Um, and I'm glad that you were able to see the problem and try to you know bring a solution a solution to it. So I definitely look forward to talking more about your entrepreneurial journey um, towards the end of the program. Um, so you know, we're I'm speaking to you from my house. You're speaking to me from your home. You know, it's COVID nineteen pandemic has taken over the world as we know it. Um, in the intro, I alluded to the fact that uh, LifeBank is doing some very impactful work. So I'd like to first start by asking you, how is the pandemic affecting you as a person and also your business? Oh, the pandemic, um, I basically had to learn to lead all like completely from scratch. Um, I'm sort of like a face-to-face -face type person. So I like to see my team. I get energy from them when I see them. They give me, you know, I give them some of my positive energy. Uh, so we do a lot of meetings. I, uh, before the pandemic, I love spending time at my life bank. Um, it was my, one of my, apart from my home, uh, it's probably the second happiest place um, for me. Um, so I really just love being there with my team. We're like a very tight knit family. Um, and we really like, we care about each other. and. Um, it's like it's just good energy um so i basically have to try to figure out how to get there um get that back that same energy that same technique um and we struggled in the beginning like whatsapp you know uh, um, slack all of those things are not like having a conversation and looking someone in the high and like um, being able to communicate and come to 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 you know so it was really difficult personally um, I had to do a lot of work. So while everybody was locked down, I had to not only work as hard as I could, and I feel all women, you know, all, 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 all professionals have to work uh, at home, but also we have to take care of children. I've got two kids, uh, I have to look after them. They were out of school. Um, they even actually got out of school um, a little bit earlier than, um, than I think the rest of the city. Uh, so we had been in Stockholm for a very long time and had to look after their school. And so it was hard. It was a lot of work. And also it was an emotional time. Um, you know, I tweeted a couple of uh, weeks before shutdown that I was quite surprised that my son knew very much about uh, COVID-19. He knew that he could die. And he is very, he's six years old. And um, I, I remember talking to him and I was completely surprised how much he knew and how afraid he was. You know, I, I wasn't paying attention. So it was really hard. But I think I like to say that we were made for times like this. Um, everything in our past was preparing us for this. Um, and I'm really glad that we've been able to, at least at Life Bank, we've been able to do our duty. We, we, we rose to the occasion and we did what we had to do. No, I mean, you absolutely did what you have to do. Um, so you and Beyonce have one, have one thing in common. <laughs> a very amazing tweet that I have to, I wish I could pull up. But essentially, uh, you both have, uh, you know, brought testing capacities to your city. So for those of you who don't understand the context of what we're talking about, Beyonce Knowles um, is an artist um, and she is from Texas and she set up testing facilities for people in Texas. And Tammy, our very own Beyonce of Nigeria, has also um, set up uh, testing facilities, mobile testing facilities. You were actually the first to, um, to set up mobile testing facilities in the country. So that's a huge achievement. So congratulations for that. Um, so tell us, tell, us about, tell us about these testing facilities for COVID-19. So, you know, I, my day job is to run a distribution business. Um, I am in healthcare, so I do know quite a lot of people in healthcare. And to be quite honest, we have a partner with a government agency called Nigerian Institute of Medical Research, NIMAR. 
And um, Neymar, uh, we had a relationship pre-COVID. We were running some clinical trials with them, mostly around blood safety. And um, we already had a sort of like a rapport with them. But so I needed a test for somebody who was very close to me. And that person had traveled, he had, you know, he had finished his quarantine um, for 14 days, but there was uh, intense need, you know, emotional need to figure out whether you're, you know, positive or negative. Um, yeah. And he had that need. And because I was in healthcare, I, I called around and I figured out that Naima had the capacity to test. Uh, so I asked them for a test, um, and it was through that process that I realized that, you know, other families, other people, other professionals are, wouldn't want the same thing. I wasn't actually thinking about people who were already positive. I was just thinking about people who wanted to know whether they are positive or negative. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't thinking about people with symptoms or anything like that. I just wanted to help more people because I got this help um, and because I had this access. So we were having this conversation and it came to us and Naima, you know, I, I was able to meet with the leadership of Neymar and then they were like, oh, you know, we could do this. And I said, what about a drive through They had a parking lot across the uh, structure uh, in Yaba and that parking lot, um, you know, was absolutely empty. It was very large. And I was like, we can set it up here. And um, we had a conversation within six weeks. I mean, sorry, within six days, we were up and running and we got our first patient. And I was so surprised at the amount of interest and the amount of, you know, we've been able to test over 2,600 people in this tiny facility. Um, I've been surprised at um, how much we've been able to do. And of course, we didn't stop at Lagos. Lagos is actually not my hometown. Uh, so I wasn't actually referring to Lagos in my tweet. My hometown, um, where I grew up, uh, is Ibadan. Um, so, I, so after the nine month uh, testing facility, um, I got together with um, Citizen for Citizen Initiative, which is run by Mrs. Awushika, who's also you know, an Ibadan uh, native. Uh, yeah. You know, we partner with them, they funded our facility, and then we partner with um, the Oyo State Government, and the three of us work together to open, uh, with Naimas also providing some advice for us and some uh, strategic help. Uh, so the four partners came together and opened a facility in Oyo State, which, is, which was what I was referring to, like, you know, well, I'm now Beyonce. <laughs> Dancing, but at least I have something to come up with that. <laughs> That's really fantastic. I mean, it's really amazing that you've been able to to use your healthcare background and to you know really make a difference. So, can you walk us through a little bit how these um, testing centers work? So, if someone wanted to get tested at one of these centers, what would the protocol be? Right. So previously, you had to meet what was called the case definition. So basically, you have to like meet a certain standard set to set aside. The standards were set by the Nigerian uh, Center for Disease Control. Uh, but recently, I think they've relaxed that completely because of what we call um, community transmission. So basically, right. the beginning, right? In the beginning, you only got uh, COVID-19 if you had traveled or if you had direct contact with someone who had traveled. Uh, so that was what was, you know, that was the case definition. You needed to have travel history and you needed to either have travel history or contact with a confirmed case. So in the beginning, it was sort of like, you know, people were interested and we couldn't really test them because they didn't meet the case definition. Uh, but recently, since community transmission is so significant now, um, you know, the majority of cases now have no travel history whatsoever. Uh, it means that you can't use that to determine who gets to get tested or not. So they relax that. So basically, if you're interested in getting tested, you just go on our website. Uh, either you call your state uh, NCDC hotline or you call yeah. our website um, or you go to the Naima website uh, register and, uh, and if you meet certain standards you're called uh, to get tested okay all right so I hope that's helpful for um, those of you who are watching um so Timmy I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, leadership in crisis so mm -hmm. you know you it seems as though you've had to step into a, you know a, a heightened a heightened level of leadership especially given this COVID-19 um, so talk to us a little bit about that. What are some of the things that you're learning about leadership in crisis? I, you know, I struggle with the idea of me being a leader. Right. Um, I think that everything that I've ever done that I think has been 
uh, thrust me into the public eye or thrust me to a different level of where I was um, has been I have been reluctant. Um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the funniest thing when I tell people, even being an entrepreneur, I was completely reluctant. Um, every time someone, I remember when every, every milestone, major milestone, I remember the first time uh, Mark Zuckerberg tweeted about or mentioned Life Bank on his, on his life, um, live, um, uh, was doing some Facebook Live. Um, I remember basically turning off my phone switching on my email, going, I, I drove down to Ibadan and hid out, you know, in this tiny little house with my family for as until it was over and then I came back and I went back to work. So I'm not like the most um yeah like I, I I mean I'm I don't I don't like the attention. I don't I don't have a natural inclination inclination to um push myself for leadership roles. I always feel like what happens is I just happen to have some skills that, um, so leadership is one thing, but I think duty is another thing. So I've always felt like I had a duty to Nigeria, a duty to Africa, a duty to my community. Um, and I think that duty is what drives me, not like a, a need to be a leader. Um, so I think for me personally, it is um, the way that I see leadership, if you will call me a leader, the way that I see my leadership is doing my duty and using the skills that I have, um, the experiences, the expertise that I have uh, to help my country uh, because it's my duty. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, I, I can definitely understand um, the shyness around the attention, but like you said, your duty, duty sometimes comes in, in the form of leadership. Um, so I'd like to talk a bit about, you know, the internal runnings of, of, so I guess what I meant by leadership was more so in terms of the way that you've been leading your company, I guess, like internally during this crisis. So how, how would you say that you have, your leadership has had to change? So, you know, you mentioned how you, you know, you love having face-to-face -face meetings. Um, you know, people at this time are, are, are emotional, um, you know, things are a bit uncertain. So let's talk about leadership from that perspective. I guess leadership from an internal, um, an internal leadership perspective. Absolutely. Um, so as a leader, um, I believed in um, serving my team and coaching them. I have a very young team, uh, but they're absolutely passionate about Life Bank. They are Team Life Bank. Um, you know, they, they push me to do better. Um, maybe that's why I love that um, energy, a life bank, but because mm -hmm. they're simply, when I have doubts, um, I go to life bank and talk to a couple of them. And they're the ones who sort of like get me excited and get me focused um, and get me, and they get me to keep working and keep doing the work. Um, so having to sort of like switch that and then actually be the one to now um, speak to them, inspire them, calm them, you know, tell the truth, but not too much where, you know, they're getting really worried um, was really difficult. Um, but I think I had done a lot of work, you know, before COVID-19, um, I had, you know, I like to think of being a leader um, or being a leader as uh, building into people. So putting, put, depositing positive thing, depositing, um, um, mentoring and modeling good behavior to them. Um, and I think that that really helped us. Uh, for example, we have, we have two separate teams. Uh, there is the fulfillment team. They are the riders who are out there 24 seven delivering these critical supplies. And right. then there's sort of like the support team, um, you know, the finance, the tech team, you know, the, the ones that are supporting the, the business. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the fulfillment team, the call center, the riders, and, and all the operations team, they have to keep showing up at work um, because we are essential services. So mm -hmm. while does our COVID work, um, the core team of LifeBank had to keep showing up at work because uh, babies don't know, babies who need to be delivered <laughs> don't know that there's COVID-19 and they should delay their delivery. Thing, right? Thank God for that, that they don't do that. Right, exactly. We don't want that. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, so, you know, I, I had to basically inspire a bunch of people who had to leave their home because they couldn't actually, because of the shutdown, they couldn't go up and down. Uh, so they had to leave in the office and I couldn't live with them because, you know, I'm not essential staff. So I had to basically take from all the things I had deposited earlier 
and use that to sort of inspire them and get them to commit uh, to staying, staying at work and doing the work on behalf of our, our country. And I think what really, what helps is that the same idea of duty, the same sense of duty that I mentioned is what I've tried to instill and inspire in them. That they're not here to make Timmy rich. They're not here to do anything like that. They're not even there to help our shareholders, you know, be rich. What they're there for is to save people's lives. And because they're like the direct link between Life Bank and the patient, they speak to the patient, they speak to the medical team, they, they feel themselves like their medical team. Um, I think they were able to, they were willing to do the work and I am so incredibly, incredibly proud of them. I, I feel emotional about the sacrifice. They literally didn't go home for over three weeks. They just right. all stayed in the same office doing the work in all the locations across Nigeria. And I am just proud of them. No, absolutely. And I think that, um, I think that people are now starting to have it, you know, not that the respect wasn't there for the medical field. But I think there's a heightened level of respect. Um, I think when crisis like this happens, you know, people really realize what's important. And um, we must really commend, you know, all the health workers in Nigeria, all around the world that are doing this amazing, very important work. It's not easy to be, you know, like you said, on the, out and about when there's a virus around. Um, I always say, you know, being able to work from home is a privilege. So um, thank you for the work that you guys are doing at, at Life Bank. It really is. Um, important and, and I hope that um, this crisis will also inspire other people to start other essential service business businesses so impact driven um, businesses so speaking of, of impact um, you you won the Jack Ma entrepreneurship award uh, earlier this year last year and la late last year late last yeah. year um, so congratulations, that's really huge. So tell us, tell us, tell us a bit about that. What was that like? It was really cool. I mean, I met um, Jet Li <laughs> as someone who, who was, you know, that was like the highlight. Like, I was like, oh my God, Jack, hey, I Jack, Jack Jet Li. And I was like, Jet Li, oh my God. Um, but no, like, it, was, <laughs> it was really great. Um, I, you know, first I was part of like this um, incredible list of amazing companies uh, doing really incredible work across the world. I felt like, oh my God, you know, how do I even compete with them? But, you know, the, the reality is we were all winners. Um, right. I did the work. I studied. I, you know, I, I remember I had pitched by heart. Um, my assistant, Aisha, would call me in the middle of the night and say, take the pitch again. And then I'll do it. And she'll be like, and she was like, she's really tough. <laughs> and, you know, she would get me to like do it over and over until I had it, you know, by heart. I could say, I could, you know, say the entire 10 minutes off the top of my head and just do it. Um, and I think also like people were really interested and, and the team is, Awashika was on the stage. Jack Ma was there. Josiah was there. Um, and, and, um, you know, there were so many leaders across the world who were on that, you know, who were helping us that day. And for me, I think they were really interested in the, in the elegance of our model, in the simplicity of the model. So the, our model is very simple. We just move one thing from point A to point B. It's really like, it's not, of course we use tech, it's tech and a good, you know, it's actually more complex than that. But literally when you're looking at it from the outside, it's like, oh, they move this to this. But the impact is immense. Um, it's literally, you know, Life Bank stands in the in the middle of someone, um, a member of our community, and death. That's it. You know, they're about to die. We show up. We give them what they need, and they survive. And it's 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 incredible. You know, when you enter our office at Life Bank, you see little hearts, little red hearts on the wall. And in that heart, in that little red heart, we have the first name of the person whose life we saved. So we have a, about eight thousand three hundred little red hearts on our wall in the office. So when you, maybe that's one of the reasons why I love my office so much that I miss it. Um, <laughs> but when you enter the office- 3,000 lives, I mean, that's huge. That, 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 that's, that's huge. It is. We're waiting till we get to 10,000 to really celebrate. We're gonna shut the city down and really, really go out there and celebrate when we hit that 10,000 lives. Yeah. Absolutely, and we look forward to celebrating that with you. So what, if I can ask, what is your goal? Do you have a number that, you know, do you, Life Bank by X amount of a uh, year, I want to have saved X amount of lives? You know, we don't have that. Uh, maybe we just said that, but we don't have that. I think 
what we just want to do is, you know, we've been 24 hours, uh, seven days a week since we launched. Uh, so we are about four and a half years old and we've never shut down. And uh, we want to just continue that. It's a very simple goal. Um, it's very like boring. We're very simple people, our life bank. And what we just want to do is make sure that we're doing our duty every single day and that when we show up, we're relentless. We are driving excellence in terms of we want to be operationally efficient. We want to be, you know, we want to be efficient across all standards so that we can just keep the lights on, right? And help as many people as we can. Of course, our big dream is to expand, right? We, we are currently in five cities in Nigeria. Uh, we're in Lagos. Yeah. Sorry? I was going to say, could you name those cities? Oh, right. Uh, Lagos, Abuja, Port Harcourt, uh, very just launched in Ibadan and about to launch in Kano. Um, so we, we already, you know, we have presence in five cities. Uh, we're working on, we already, we just hired a team out, out in Kenya, uh, looking to expand to Kenya, looking at Ethiopia, looking at Cairo, looking at so many other markets. Uh, so that's, that's what we want to do. We want to expand and keep the light on and continue to drive that impact every day. Mm -hmm. no, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, we definitely look forward to seeing that Pan-African expansion. Um, so speaking of expansion, as you know, you know, any business needs finance to be able to expand and to scale. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that before we delve into a little bit about your personal journey before um, LifeBank. So talk to us about raising finance for your business. How did you start LifeBank? Did you start it? Did you self-start it? Did you get finance in the beginning? Talk to us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I, raising money for any company is difficult, difficult, difficult. Um, you know, there is, there's no two ways about that. Like, you know, it's hard to raise for any, any company. It's harder still to raise for an African company. It's harder still to raise for a healthcare company. It's even harder to raise when you're a woman and then when you're a sole founder, right? So there's so many things, you know. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, co founders and sole founder. Um, right. So it's really, 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 you know, hard out there, to be honest. Um, I think for us, we've raised a couple of rounds, three significant rounds. Um, we raised a pre seed. Uh, when we launched, we raised a seed round and we raised a couple of other um, uh, uh, bridge rounds uh, recently. And we're in our Series A process now. We're raising a, a, a Series A and, and it's going pretty well. Um, for, for, you know, when we launched, I, I started the business and I built the platform, you know, with money from my pocket uh, because it's really important to, have to show skin in the game. And I remember when I spoke to the first, Live Bank's first ever backer, which was CC Hub, um and they're like oh you gotta quit your job oh and i remember when they told me that and i had a great job i really liked my job it wasn't i wasn't unemployed you know at all like you know i had a good job and i was very good at it i was actually making movies um i was making health movies and we would sort of like had like product placement but a message a medical message in popular nollywood movie movies and i really had that it was good like i hung out with like celebs all the day all the time I hung out <laughs> with, like sets and it was really fun i liked it and I, <laughs> I read scripts um and then i got to do healthcare to health messaging so it was really fun um it was a combination but, of all, the, all your passion basically exactly um so i was it was really good i liked my job and i was paid very well as well um so when but i knew this this live bank um, is, is my life's work. And I basically went through a long process of um, 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 making the case for why I should, um, why I should quit my job and, and start Life Bank. So I then, I, I started Life Bank and um, it's been incredible. When, when I went back to them and said, oh, I am ready. I'm ready to quit my job. Um, they were really surprised. They're like, wow, okay. Um, and then they, they signed the first check to Live Bank, which was kind of like a pre seed. Um, and then, um, and you know, we, we sort of like started growing ever since. Yeah. Wow. So you, so you, okay, so that's so, so you raised that amount and then you've kind of been just growing ever since. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you've been receiving things like the Jack Ma um, Foundation Entrepreneurship. Um, yeah. was that, that was a prize, it wasn't a grant. 
No, 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 the prize. Yes, yeah. we've actually yeah. done very well with prizes, but not very well with grants. Um, surprisingly enough, uh, we've done very well with um, you know winning those sort of prizes that allows you to sort of like plug the hole until you're mm -hmm. ready for the next round. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And in terms of positioning your, your you know your business for financing, I mean obviously Life Bank. I think it kind of sells itself in a way because it's such an essential service and it's, um, you know, it's kind of obvious why mm. investors would, be, want, would want to invest in that kind of business. But, you know, for the startups who are watching, entrepreneurs that may be wondering, you know, how to position themselves, maybe position is not the right word, um, but I guess like how do you build a business, a business of value um, mm. that attracts um, investments? Right. So, you know, they're impact investors and they're just pure investors. Mm -hmm. um, when I tell you that all, most of our investors are pure um, commercial investors, pure equity plays and not impact, uh, people are constantly surprised. Um, the reason why is that we built a model that is profitable but also impactful. So the way we describe Life Bank is Life Bank is in the business of saving lives, right? The business is the first thing. So you hear it first. It's the business uh, of saving lives. Mm -hmm. What we do saves lives. Uh, so what we actually do has impact. Uh, mm -hmm. But business comes first. And it's pretty important to have that business bit uh, come first. So we're in the business of saving lives. Business comes first. Um, and um, and um, then the, the impact also comes after. And I think that's why we've been very successful in getting uh, investors to be interested in our, business, in our work. Uh, because mm -hmm. investors ultimately want value. They want to make sure that the, uh, you know, they're, um, um, you know, they get returns on their investment. Yeah. And they don't want to just give money. It's not a grant. It's not a prize. You know, it's, it's right. a huge investment. Uh, so we have to make sure that we're delivering that value to our shareholders, um, but at the same time, do impact. So the way we've been able to build it is for every value we're getting, there's a direct impact linked to it. So we don't need to do anything special to get impact. Impact is built into our model. And then the value, the financial value also is built into it. Um, and that's been the, why we've been um, moderately successful in terms of getting investors. I, I like I like the the humility moderately successful. That's <laughs> what I mean. I mean I think it's an important distinction that you make. So for the audience watching, impact investing is a is, is is an investment whereby you you have you want to create impact, but you also want to generate a return. So I think the distinction is very important um, because people get it confused a lot of times. Impact investing aims to have both a financial return and impact on society. And I have a huge feeling that the investing landscape is going to change dramatically. And what we considered impact before, I think is going to change a lot, especially in the healthcare, healthcare space. Okay, um, so thank you for answering that question around raising finance. Um, I'd like to talk to you a bit about your, your journey before. I mean, I know we've talked about it a little bit, but I'd like to dive um, into that because I think there's a lot that people can learn. So talk to us, walk us through your career before um, starting Life Bank. I know that you have 10 years of health management um, experience um, in the UN, Lagos State Government, World, World Health um, Organization. So walk us through um, briefly a little bit about that and also if there's any lessons that you've learned um, from your previous experience to what you're doing now, also kindly tell us about that. Right. Uh, so I've had this ex uh, interest in healthcare, uh, but I'm not a healthcare person. I have absolutely no, I've, you know, I, I didn't even study science. I studied uh, political science as an undergrad, and then I studied management um, mm -hmm. in my, for my master's degree. So after mm -hmm. I, I was done with my master's, I knew I was going into healthcare. Um, because mainly because I had, before I was done with my master's, um, you know, I, I grew up in the U.S., so I, I had my master's in the U.S., uh, mm -hmm. So between year one and year two, I had this like uh, three months when I came to Nigeria and worked in Kano. Um, mm -hmm. And it was sort of like my experience there that um, in Kano's ministry, you know, in, in Kano, Kaduna, Jigawa's uh, health system, that mm -hmm. got me super interested in doing health system work 
in developing countries. So after that, I went to work at the World Health Organization doing health financing. So mm -hmm. first I wanted to know, how do you finance the health system? You know, what needs to go into it? How do you actually build out the financial systems uh, for, 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 for a medical system? So then I, um, after that, I went back to the US. I did some health tech work, um, basically, um, was doing some work around epic um epic systems and helping hospitals in the u.s um you know register on the epic system uh and then i got a gig to work in uganda in east africa to do some health supply chain work um so again different points parts of i think i was just sort of like interested in all the different stuff um uh, all this, this different systems um, and sectors that make up a, a full health system. Um, and then when I decided, after Uganda, I decided to, I got married uh, to a great Nigerian guy. And uh, so we decided to move back to Nigeria and live here. We basically came here to get married and then just never left. Um, and <laughs> and um, I, I went to work for uh, Lagos State, again, in healthcare, in um, you know, uh, operations management for uh, what is called ASIMA now. Uh, it's basically facility management. Um, so I, I worked there for a while, and then I went to the Nollywood job that I mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, all the different parts of healthcare. Um, and I basically just, I was just curious. I was curious about the system, about how, um, what are the things that need to be there so that a doctor does his job well, so that a nurse does their our job well so that you know a lab scientist a pharmacist all the different you know service delivery portion of healthcare what are the things that are around it that make sure that when doctors are in the hospital or when someone's at home and, and interested in learning about healthcare um they're having they're getting the best service um ever mm -hmm. so that was that was my interest that's my professional interest mm -hmm. um so that's sort of like in, in terms of how that has helped life bank you know, it's basically just training. Uh, I like to say that everything in, in previous to LiveBank, everything before LiveBank was training me to run LiveBank. Um, and it's just been, it's, it's incredibly useful. Um, mm -hmm. The amount of uh, technical and real life experience that I've had in, in building and, and, and changing health systems. No, I mean, it really seems like you, you got all the experience that you needed and that kind of led you to creating life bank and you it seems like you've been able to garner all the experience um however i would yeah, like, I would to like a lot of these things don't make sense in in as you're living your life i didn't set out to say oh i'm gonna get this experience and this experience i'm not like a, a genius in that sense like I, I didn't i didn't set it out you know my life just it makes sense when i'm thinking back at all the different things i was doing um, so I, I don't want everybody out there to say, okay, oh, I can't do this if I don't have all this experience. No, that's not what I'm saying. You probably have all the experience you need to do whatever it is you want to do, whatever you, you feel called to do. Um, mm -hmm. I say that, you know, God does not give you more than you can, you can handle. Uh, so you've probably been trained already on a lot of the things that you need to do, or at least in the fundamental sense of that. So don't feel like you need to be, you know, I mean, I wasn't a medical doctor and a lot of people didn't believe that I could do it because they didn't have this medical degree. Um, but I didn't let that stop me. I felt like I already knew the fundamental portion of how to build a structure and everything else that I didn't know, I learned. Nice. So I learned from the job uh, and that's what I think you can do too. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and I'm glad that you, you make that distinction. Um, we don't want people to think that you have to have all this experience, but um, so I guess that brings me into the Q and A session um, of this. So, in terms, you talk about you know alignment a lot. I've heard you talk about this throughout this um, this conversation. So, what advice do you have for young people who are looking to find their why, or they're looking to find um, what that thing is that they really want to be doing? What advice do you have for people like that? Hmm. Um, what can you not stop thinking about? Uh, that's it. I couldn't stop thinking about why women were dying in childbirth. It was special to me. I don't understand. It was before I was a mother myself. Um, mm -hmm. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. It seemed like an injustice. Um, you were doing, you know, here you are, you're a fully grown woman. You know, your parents had done you know, all they needed to do to keep you alive up till your, you know, your adulthood. And now you want to bring out life to the world, give the world a gift. 
and then something very silly, something not, not, not really difficult, then causes the death. I, I just think it's an injustice. And I've always felt that way. Ever since I discovered, you know, personally found out that women died in childbirth, I have always felt like it was a special injustice that, you know, you have all these hopes and all these dreams for your child and then, and then you just die. Like on that moment, you're right at the cusp of it, of, of, of having this miracle uh, happen and then you die. Uh, so I've always, I couldn't stop thinking about it. No matter how much I tried, no matter how much I wanted to have a really nice life and a nice job where I can go to the spa, I really like the spa, um, <laughs> where I can really like, you know, enjoy my life. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. So I think whatever you're called to do is what is a problem you can't stop thinking about. Um, for me, I think if you want to have impact, that's what it's all about. Um, because you're going to need it. And, and you're gonna need that passion and you're gonna need that uh, commitment uh, because it's gonna get hard when you get to sort of like the, the trove, uh, the, 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 you know, that, that part of building where you, you feel worse and you feel terrible. And, you know, you're asking people to, you know, why won't someone fire me? You can't even quit, but you're looking for somebody to say you're fired, you know. When you get to that level of, not feeling competent, um, what you're gonna need is that passion. What you're gonna need is that commitment to solving a specific problem. So what I always say to anybody who wants to start is make sure that the problem you've chosen to solve is a problem that you care about because you're gonna need to have that care um, when things get really hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's definitely, that definitely um, makes a lot of sense. We have a question here from Coyote. He's asking, um, LifeBank has been able to decrease blood delivery time from 24 hours to less than 45 minutes. Why did blood deliveries take so long in the past? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think that um, what, what, the reason why it took so long in the past is more sophisticated, right? Um, first, you have to first know who has the stock right? Uh, which of the blood bank, they're, they're about 100 blood banks in Lagos. I think even more. Um, so you first have to know who has the stock. You don't know who has it. You know, there's no way for you to know who has it uh, before life bank. Then you have to make sure that you can reach them, right? And usually babies are not, babies don't come on schedule, right? So you have to make sure that, you know, you can't schedule your childbirth as, you know, I'm going to have this baby at 2 p.m. on, you know, on Thursday. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, you can't, you can't do that. So you simply have to, they don't come on schedule. So when you need it, you have to make sure that the blood bank, you can reach at least one blood bank. And it's hard. Um, a lot of blood banks before live banks are on 24-hour service. They didn't work on weekends. On Sunday morning, they are at church. Some of them are in the mosque, you know, on Friday, and you really can't reach them. Some of them go to the bar and, you know, they're drunk and they can't pick up their calls. And, you know, that, that was what was happening. You know, they're human beings, they have lives, so they go live that life and they're not available to, to patients. Um, and then you have to actually, so let's say you're, you're lucky enough to get the blood, then you have to now find how it's going to get to you, um, to wherever you are. Uh, quickly enough and in the right condition. And that right condition is important because blood has to, kept, has to be kept cold uh, throughout its life cycle. So from the time it's removed from someone's vein, it has to be put in a cold environment until it's actually transfused into someone else. Uh, so you then have to make sure that whoever is bringing it to you, you know, has the right coaching system so that it's not terrible by the time it gets to you because that happens often. Mm -hmm. And then... And, and the last part of that is you also have to make sure that, you know, there are no blood donors. So first you have to make sure that, so that the blood actually exists. Mm -hmm. So that was why it took so long. That was why it took forever. Um, and all that problem, all the problem that I mentioned is literally all the things Life Bank has built to solve it. Uh, we had to build, it did an inventory system so that blood banks can tell us the inventory they had. We have to make sure that they're open 24 hours because, because we are open 24 hours. Then they decided to start opening 24 hours themselves. Then we had to build a distribution system. We had to make sure that all the distribution systems are coaching. We had to get blood boxes, specially designed. We had to get um, 
uh, Bluetooth padlocks. You have to get temperature strips to monitor the temperature of the blood when it's been distributed. Um, and then finally, we had to, you know, we had to make sure that there's no blood donors, you know, that can give blood into the system. Although we're not a blood bank ourselves, we have to make sure that at least our blood banks have enough supply. Uh, so those are the things we had to do to make sure that um, we get that time from tw 24 hours down to 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for that. I'm um, speaking of inventory. I know that you have started a COVID-19 inventory. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, so uh, we had to, um, you know, there, there are critical medical supplies that are needed in COVID-19, there are critical equipment that are needed to, to treat COVID-19 patients. Uh, so we wanted to do some work around gathering those information and putting it in. You know, literally a lot of the things that's, that, that hurt Nigerians, uh, either in healthcare or education or whatever, it's just putting resources in one place where people can't see it. You know, sometimes you just don't know what's going on. Right. Transparency yeah. or like just, it's not even, people are not trying to hide. Sometimes I find out that they're not trying to hide the information. They're simply not aware that other people it's not need made available. It's just not exactly. made available for public exactly. knowledge. Exactly. Yeah. So getting all this information, disparate information and putting it in one place is so important. And that's what we've been able to do. Uh, so we simply just said, okay, how do we gather how do we gather inventory information and, and um, how do we make sure that things are available for people who need it? Yeah. And uh, so what we did is we gathered equipment information. So we found all the ventilators, respirators, ICU beds um, across Nigeria. Uh, we started moving oxygen. So we, our oxygen delivery system, we called Air Bank. Uh, so we started delivering oxygen to, to um, uh, isolation centers where uh, COVID-19 patients have been treated. Okay, and can you give us any updates on what those numbers are or where can people access that information? Uh, in terms of the ICU beds and yeah, the equipment, right. So the service is called QIP. Uh, you can find out how many we found at quip.livebank.ng. Uh, this service is also available in Kenya uh, at quip.livebank.ke. Um, so you can really just go on those sites and you can find which states and, and which and how many units of um, isolator, um, um, you know, um, ventilators, respirators, and then the ICU beds. So you can go and check it out. We're not sharing that information to the general public, but we share it with the isolation centers in case they need it. In case yeah. they need it. Okay, so at least they know where to get it if they need it. Exactly. Okay, Timmy, so we're coming to the end, almost to the end of the show. Um, it's been, you know, it's been an hour, but it's gone by so fast. It's been, it's been really interesting and speaking to you. Um, and I wonder if there's anything that you'd like to leave um, our audience with before we, before we end the program. Right, I just want to say to everybody that, you know, greatness is evenly distributed. Um, I don't think I'm special at all. Um, of course, Beyonce is awesome, <laughs> but, and I'm trying to be just like her, uh, but I don't think I'm special. Um, I think simply all I did was uh, lean into my duty and lean into uh, my, my, my responsibilities um, as, a, as a Nigerian to try to help the country as much as I can. I think that if we all decide to fix a small part of our country, that we will all get to, like, we'll get a, a good country. Um, and I think that businesses with a social impact at the heart of them are the, way, are the, are the best way. Um, uh, starting businesses that are, have impact uh, built into them are probably the most um, um, best, are the best way to do it. So I think that's my message to the world. Um, we should all get together, uh, do our duty for our country, for our community, figure out the problems we are called to solve and basically throw yourself into it and hopefully you are rewarded. Fantastic. I mean, thank you so much for that, Timmy. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Um, I think you really exemplify what it means to be an impact-driven entrepreneur. Um, and as we're seeing with this crisis and you know, other crises that have happened, impact is really where um, we're able to have our, imp our, our, print, our imprint in the world. So if you can have impact and make money while doing it, you know, why not? Um, so Tammy Giwa, thank you so much for taking the time um, to come on the show, Scaling Through Crisis, brought to you by Business Day and Endeavor Nigeria. And we really look forward to keeping in touch with you 
if people want to stay in touch with you, can you tell us your social media handles? Um, is there any, like if people want to um, sure. you know, get in touch? Yes. So if you want to get in touch with me, I'm on Twitter at T E M I T E. Um, I am, that's probably where, like, that's where I spend my time. <laughs> um, you can also shoot me an email. It's Tammy with an E, T U M I E, at lifebank.ng. Thank you. Okay, cool. Tammy, thank you so much. Please do take care of yourself and keep us updated on what um, the, the amazing work that LifeBank is doing. All right. Thank you so much for your time and for having me. Have a very great day. You're most welcome. You too. Take care. Yes. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Scaling Through Crisis, brought to you by Business Day and in partnership with Endeavor Nigeria. I had such a great time speaking to Timmy Giwa Tubosun, who is the CEO um, and founder of LifeBank. LifeBank is, is doing amazing work um, pre and um, during COVID-19. So I really encourage you to check out their work. Um, they deliver essential medical services um, to medical facilities around the country. They're, they are in five locations. So just go to www.lifebank.ng to check that out. Again, my name is Lily Balde and I work with Business Day Media. It's been a pleasure speaking um, with Tammy today and thank you all for tuning in. We're having another episode of Scaling Through Crisis tomorrow at 2 p.m. West African time. So please make sure to tune into that. And we also have a great lineup of interviews for next week so i look forward to having you guys tune in to those um, if you have any questions about the show if you have any comments if you have anything that you'd like to share with us please do so um, at scaling so scaling s um s c a l i n g at businessday.ng and you can also follow us at Business Day NG on all social media handles. Um, and please also subscribe to Business Day. Go to www.businessday.ng um, to stay up to date on what's happening with the economy, um, the pandemic, uh, politics, everything in between businesses for SMEs, um, we're the go to media house for that. So thank you, and I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Take care. <laughs>